وبارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت باركت على ابراهيم وال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد now that is the definition of a sahabi and that is the status of the sahaba in terms of generally as our belief as muslims and in the knowledge of hadith their status that all of them are thiqatun udul reliable trustworthy and the narrations are taken and of course like we always said before in the first um, series of these classes people are different the narrations are different right someone can have better memory than another one but all of them the narrations are accepted that is something which all of us we experience like i said so the example i gave you the narration from abu bakr siddiq and the narration from this bedouin they are both accepted but obviously the one from abu bakr is more authentic and more valuable it's just obvious because he was someone who was the closest to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the most knowledgeable now after discussing that the sheikh now he says he brings us a sub chapter the last companions to die and their death place this is something they mentioned in the books of hadith so that it's important this is important so that you know when the companions passed away and when did the last of them pass away to show that the other generation had began before he says number one, the last companion to die in makka was amr ibn wathila al-laythi should be al-laythi not laythi al-laythi Amr ibn Wathila al-Layfi L-A-Y-T-H-E-E Radiallahu anhu Who died in the year 110 Hijri 110 Hijri What is the year now we are in? What is the Islamic year now? 1435 1435 1435 Hijri As you see they put the year with a capital H 110110H what does the H mean? Hijri. The H means Hijri. Meaning the Hijra calendar. The Islamic calendar. It started during the after the Hijra of the Prophet. The year when he made Hijra migration from Makkah to, to Medina. When he left Makkah to go to Medina. The Islamic calendar, they started it from that point. And the Hijri calendar was formulated during the Khilaf of Umar. Anhu. Umar was the one who started it, meaning an official calendar. And he differed, they differed with the other Sahaba. When should you begin it? When should you begin to start the number of the years? During the time when the Prophet was born? Or the time when he was given prophethood? Or the time he migrated? Or the time he passed away? Then they all uh, agreed that the day he made hijrah that's when everything changed that's when everything changed when he left Mecca to go to Medina so they said we'll start the calendar from that day some of them they said we start the calendar if I'm not wrong from the day of the Fath of Mecca from the Fath of Mecca from the conquest of Mecca when the Muslims went back to Mecca and conquered it and Mecca became an Islamic land again All of those, but anyways, hand, when we mention when they when they put the year, sorry, when they put the year, they put that capital H. It means Hijri. The Christians, when they put the year like 1992, 2015, they put what after it? They put AD or CE. CE is not the Christians. CE is used universally because it means it means Christian era. 2015 Christian era they counted from the year supposedly when uh, Isa was born Christ okay which obviously nobody knows the exact year from them AD is what they use officially the Christians AD means what huh? Anno Domino after the death of our Lord that's what they say Anno Domino after the death of our Lord 
مسلم من نصب استر على كل حال is 1435 what is the date today what is the month today islamic it is jumada athani what is the date today second نعم what is the islamic date jumada athani is it second or third It's the third. It's one. Okay. But it's very important, you want to know that, and akhawat. It's very important, serious. It is very important to know the Islamic date. These are things which are enforced on the people during the colonial time. They were enforced on everyone. We have our own calendar. This is mentioned in the Quran. We have own number of months, our own sacred months, our own holidays. It's very important. You have to be proud of who you are. We're not saying don't use the other one. We're not saying like some people, um, they have the wrong mentality that we should stay away from all these uh, new things which are not ours. So you don't never use the, 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 the calendar which people use, January, February, 2014, 2015. You cannot live like that in today's world. You cannot. Right? But at least don't forget your own. Don't forget your own. Anyway, so the last companion to die in Mecca was Amr ibn Wathila al-Layfi. And he died in the year 110 Hijri. And he was in fact the last of all the companions. No other companion lived longer than he did. He was the last of all those 114,000. Amr was the last companion to die, period. Some say it was Anas bin Malik, but most scholars they say it was Amr ibn Wathi. The year 110 Hijr. The last companion, number two, to die in Medina was Muhammad ibn Rabi'a al-Ansar al-Khazraj. He died in the year 99 Hijr. The last companion, number three, to die in Damascus, Dimash, which is Sham, was Wa'il ibn Askar al-Layfi in the year 86. Number four, the last companion to die in Hims. Hims is always also today in Syria. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy on the people of Syria, the Muslims, and all the other lands. Was Abdullah ibn Bisr. Abdullah ibn Bisr. Ibn Bisr al-Muzani or al-Mazini who died in the year 96. And the last companion to die in Basra, Basra which is present day, Iraq, was Anas bin Malik al-Khazraj al-Ansari in the year 93. Number six, the last companion to die in Kufa. Kufa is where? Present day, Iraq also. Was Abdullah ibn Abi Awfi al-Aslami who died in the year 87. The last companion to die in Misr, Egypt. Was Abdullah ibn Harith ibn Jaza al-Zubaydi in the year 89. So we see none of the companions died after the year 110. Which is in accordance with the statement of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he said in the hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he, uh, sorry, he prayed with us in the last days of his life. Then after he gave the salams, he stood up and he said, in this night, meaning from this night, there will be no one, after a hundred years, there will be no one from those who are living today on the face of the earth. The Prophet Sallallahu he said on that day, a hundred years from today, no one amongst you is alive, will be alive. So this is one of the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu in fact. It's one of the prophecies which he gave and it came true. What was the year the Prophet Sallallahu died? The tenth, tenth Hijri. So ten add a hundred, 
110. Exactly the year 110, the last of the Sahabas, Amr ibn Wafila, he passed away. He passed away. This hadith was also reported by Jabir ibn Abdullah in Sahih Muslim, who stated that this statement of the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was made one month before his death, the 10th year of Hijrah. Benefits of knowing the last companions to die. Why are we mentioning this? The Sheikh says the benefits, number one, whoever claims to be a companion but died after the year 110, then his claim is rejected outright. You know that this guy, he is not true. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, none of his companions will live past the year 110, basically. Number two, whoever from amongst the successors, the tabi'een, the tabi'een, those who saw the Sahaba but never saw the Prophet. In English, we call them the successors. Whoever from the, amongst the successors did not reach the level of understanding before the year 110. Then we know his hadith are what? They are not from the Sahaba. Whoever from the successors who had not reached the age of understanding before the year of 110, can he claim to be a successor, a tabi'i? Someone who before 110 Hijri, that year, before that year, he was not someone who was mature enough to understand anything. Which generation do we consider him to be in? He is the followers of the successors, at ba'd tabi'in. Even though he will be the same as those people, they were born in the time of the Prophet, but they never saw the Prophet because they were very young, and they never took hadith from the Prophet. So they came and took hadith from the Sahaba. Even though he was born during the time of the Prophet, he's not a Sahabi. Because why? He never saw the Prophet وسلم, and believed in him and died while being a Muslim. He never understood anything. Like Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Bakr, Muhammad. Muhammad, he was born when his mother, Asma bint Umais, Asma bint Umais, and the Prophet and all the Muslims, they were going for Hajj. The ninth year, when the Prophet ﷺ was going for Hajj, or was it during the Umrah of Hudaybiyah? One of those years, if you remember, is when they were, doing, they were doing Hajj. That's when he was born. So he was born during the time of the Prophet. The Prophet ﷺ held him as a baby. But is he considered a Sahabi? No. Because by the time he was two, Two years of age, a small baby, the Prophet ﷺ died. So he is from the Sahaba? No. He is from the Tabi'in. Likewise, those people who were born when the last of the Sahabas were dying, like Amr bin Wathil and Anas, during that time 110, these people they are not considered Tabi'in because they never took knowledge from the Sahaba. Even though they were born, they were born sorry, when... <laughs> when they were alive. You understand? That's what he's trying to say. So they did not reach the age of understanding before 110. So these people, we know that they cannot be tabi'in. So between them and the Prophet, there has to be how many people if they narrate hadith? There has to be two. Sahaba, tabi'in, and then themselves. We leave the questions to the end. Write your questions so you don't forget them. Next, so that is the benefit of knowing when did they die. That's why you will see when we read books of hadith, when you read books of hadith especially, they give the date after everybody they mention, they give the date of their death, not their, not their birth. We give the date of their death, not their birth. So they'll say, Imam Malik, and they put in brackets, 190. He died in the year 190. They'll say Al Imam al Bukhari and they put the year uh, Muhammad 264. Okay? They put the year 264 in brackets. Like that. They put Imam, Imam al Nasai and they put in brackets. His is very easy. Huh? 300. Very easy. 300. 
Type like that. Okay? Next he says now. The companions who narrated the most a hadith. Like we mentioned, the Bedouin who came one day and took one hadith and went, went back to his people is not going to narrate a thousand hadith. Unlike Aisha radiallahu anha, who was a young woman, brilliant in her mind, who lived with the Prophet sallallahu Every four days or five days, or maybe the Prophet used to see them every day, his wife used to visit his wives every day. They cannot be the same. The Sahaba who came from Yemen and they sat with the Prophet for some days, then they went back. Yes, they can have a hadith, but they're not going to be the same hadith with which Umar narrated. Umar was with the Prophet every day. So who are the Sahaba who narrated the most hadith? He says, there were only a few companions who narrated more than a thousand hadith. When the scholars mentioned, they mentioned that big number, a thousand. A thousand is a lot. A thousand is a lot. Try memorizing Arba'ina Nawawiya, 42 hadith. The 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. Try memorizing. It's not difficult. It just requires an effort. Now these are the ones who memorize a thousand hadith or more. A on the top, and he mentions, we're mentioning them according to the number of narrations they had. The most at the top. The most at the top. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who narrated 5,374 hadith. 5,374 hadith. And Abu Huraira, he accepted Islam in which year? The seventh year. So he lived with the Prophet sallallahu roughly for roughly three years. But this was due to the dua of the Prophet sallallahu the Prophet made dua for him that he never forgets anything. Yes. And he used to be someone who used to be poor. Very poor. Unemployed. He had nothing. So all he would do is follow the Prophet That's all he would do. That's why when some of the Sahaba they said, Akhtarti Abu Hurairah. You have, you have so many hadith. Some of these we never heard. And he says, yes. The Muhajirun, they used to be busy in the marketplace doing business. And the Ansar, they used to take care of the dead palms. And I had nothing. I was broke. I was with the Prophet I was broke. I had nothing. All I did was sit with the Prophet So he memorized 5,374 hadith. Does it mean he's the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba? Answer is no. The answer is no. The most knowledgeable of all of them is Abu Bakr. Undisputed. No competition. He memorized more. And he related more. He lived a longer age. Maybe someone will ask how come then he narrated more hadith than Abu Bakr. And these are doubts which the enemies of Islam they put forward. And they have websites for them. You have to be very careful when you're browsing the, web, the, the internet. You just don't go to any website just because it says Islam. You have to be very careful. Very careful. They put these doubts. Or how come, and the Shia also use this, and anyone who's sick in his heart, how come he only lived three years with the Prophet and he has all this hadith? How come he has more hadith than Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr lived how many years after the Prophet Wasallam? Only two years, two and a half. And he was involved with controlling and bringing back the Islamic um, nation into stability because many people they apostates they left Islam many people they refused to give zakah they was fighting he had no time to sit and teach people no time well Abu Huraira he lived how many years after the Prophet he lived 40 six years after the Prophet so isn't it obvious that he's going to narrate more hadith anyways those are some of some of the points number two you have Abdullah ibn Umar Abdullah ibn Umar the son of Umar ibn Khattab who narrated 2,630 hadith 
and Abdullah was a young man. All of these which are coming, all of these names, they were young people. Most of them, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi passed away, they were not even 25. Young people. They were young men and women. That tells you something. What does it tell you? What does it tell you? No. Not about them. About the Prophet What does it tell you? He encouraged women to learn. That is number one. Number two. He paid special attention to the young people. There's no leader who's going to be better than the Prophet Sallallahu We have to know that. And there's no teacher who's going to be better than the Prophet Sallallahu He knew that these ones are the ones who are going to, these, as we say, the, 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 the youth are the future. He knew. He knew Abu Bakr is old. He knew Umar is old. These young people who had the time to sit with the Prophet Sallallahu and serve him, and there's nothing much to do. They are the ones who memories from him. They are the ones who carried the, the deen ahead. And it's never, it's never too young to start learning. You have to know that. We have, yes, it's never too young. I'm not saying it's never too old. No. All of us know that already. It's never too old to learn. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows. That. It's never too young to start learning. We have this problem. Oh, she's too young. Just let her play. Oh, he's too young. Just let her play. Let him play. No, no. That is then when he reaches 14, when she reaches 15 and 16, you want to teach him to her and you want to teach her how to read the Quran. And it seems like rocket science to him and her. Where were you when he was 6, 5, 7, 8, 9? That is the age you, the, the, the brain is ready to take everything. You start teaching. Yes, in portions. In portions. Very important. Very important. Next one we have Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu. How old was Anas when the Prophet Sallam died? Those of you who were here, not last Friday, Friday before in the Halakha, you heard me saying that. He was 13 years of age. Anas, he was 13 years of age. But how come he has so many hadith? How come he has so many hadith? Because? No, not because he lived long. He was the servant of the Prophet ﷺ. He was the personal assistant of the Prophet ﷺ. Next, uh, Aisha bint Abu Bakr, who was the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. She narrated 2,210 a hadith. Abdullah ibn Abbas, how old was he when the Prophet ﷺ passed away? Abdullah bin Abbas. No, a bit old. He was around 12, 12, 13, right there when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. But Ibn Abbas, those hadith, he did not just take all of them from the Prophet. Ibn Abbas was someone who had passion for knowledge. After the Prophet ﷺ, uh, passed away, he said to one of the Ansar men, he said, let's go to the Sahaba and learn knowledge. And this man, he said to him, Ya Ibn Abbas, who's going to want your knowledge when people have Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman? Who wants to come to you? He said, so I left him. And he started to go seek knowledge, from, especially from Umar and from Aisha and from Zaid, Ibn, Ibn Thabit. He used to go and sit at the door of Zayd ibn Thabit until his head would be covered with dust. And when Zayd would come out, he says, Why, what are you doing here, Ibn, ya, ya ibn Amr Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You are the cousin of the Prophet. He says, I did not want to wake you up. I want to seek knowledge from you. I want to learn. After those years passed, after years passed, that man from the Ansar, 
He said, this child, he was smarter than me. He knew what he was doing. Ibn Abbas, he is the, he's the hebra of, of this ummah, the scholar of this ummah, especially in tafsir. Next one we have Jabir ibn Abdullah. Jabir was also one of the young people during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Next we have Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was also very young when the Prophet sallallahu passed away. So he says, the fact that these seven companions narrated the most hadith does not mean that they also had the most hadith. Like I said, it does not mean they are the most knowledgeable. This is because a few number of hadith reported by a companion could be due to a number of reasons. Why does Abu Bakr have only around 200 hadith or even less? while Abu Sa'id has a thousand hadith it could be due to a number of reasons why does Hamza have a few hadith why does Khadija she doesn't have any hadith which we know of directly meaning someone narrates from Khadija a tabi'i narrates from Khadija from the prophet there's no hadith like that why because she died so early. There's no tabi'in to see Khadija. Even some of the Sahaba never saw Khadija. Aisha never saw Khadija. He says, why? Number one, an early death. An early death. Example, Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu who died in the Battle of Badr. Khadija, who died before that. It should be Uhud, yes. Good, mashaAllah. It should be Uhud, not Badr. He died at Uhud. Number two, an important job that demanded so much of the companion's time, like Uthman, who was a Khalifa. He didn't have time to narrate a, a, a lot of hadith. Number three, an early death, as well as having an important job. Example, Abu Bakr. And other reasons. Some of the companions, they did not want to narrate a hadith because they feared. They feared maybe the memory got mixed up. They feared that hadith we always mention. Man kathaba aliyya muta'amidan wa latabawwa maqa'adaw min al-nar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever lies about me intentionally, then let him take his place in the hellfire. Like Zubair ibn al-Awwam, one of the ten promised paradise. His sons, they asked him, why don't you narrate a hadith? While we see other people narrating hadith. He said, it's not because I don't know, but it's because I fear. Maybe I say something which I remember, I don't remember. And then I enter into this warning. Whoever lies about me intentional, let him take his place in the help. And other reasons. So you have Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, Anas bin Malik, Aisha, Abdullah ibn, uh, uh, ibn Abbas, Jabir, and Abu Sa'id. Those are the seven al-Mukthirun, as they known. Those narrated the most hadith. Then there are others with 600, 500, 400. These are the ones above a thousand. Above 1,000. The next chapter the Sheikh brought is about the Mukhadram. Mukhadram. What is the Mukhadram? He says, This is an individual who believed in the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during his own lifetime, meaning when the Prophet was still alive, this person believed in the Prophet. And he died upon this belief. He died as a Muslim. But he never met the Prophet of Allah. We give the example of who? An Najashi, the king of Ethiopia. He believed in the Prophet when the Prophet was alive in Medina. And he died upon Islam, but he never saw the Prophet. He never saw the Prophet. They called the Muqadr. Okay? These individuals are between the level of Sahaba and Tabi'in. They are not Sahaba. Why are they not Sahaba? Because they did not meet or see the Prophet. And they are not Tabi'in. Why are they not Tabi'in? Because they lived during the time of the Prophet. The Tabi'in, all of them, or most of them, came after the death of the Prophet. Most of them, not all of them. 
So they are between. He says, some scholars say that they are from the Kibar at Tabi'in. They are considered from the Tabi'in, the elder successors. And technically they are Tabi'in because they never met the Prophet Sallallahu But what about Najash? He never met the Prophet Sallallahu right? But he met the Sahaba. Did he meet the Sahaba? Yes. So is he Tabi'in or Sahaba? He himself, is he Tabi'in or Sahaba? He is Tabi'i, right? Even though he lived during their time. There were a few individuals who are Muhadram. They believed in the Prophet during the Prophet's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they never saw him. They never saw him. So technically, they are not defined as Sahaba. They are not defined as Sahaba. So these people, if they say, the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said this and that, is this hadith accepted or not? This Muqadram, if he says, the Prophet Sallallahu said this and that, is it accepted or not? It's not accepted because he never met the Prophet Sallallahu He never met the Prophet Sallallahu And this could be by a number of reasons, like we say. It could be he was leaving another place, and this is the most common reason. He was living a very far off place. The Prophet Sallallahu when he was alive, he sent messages, right, to different parts of the world. And he even sent messengers to different parts of the world, people to call to Islam. People believed. Those people who believed, while the Prophet was still alive in Medina, but they are in Yemen, or they are in Bahrain, or they are in Furs, they are Mukhadr. The scholars have listed up to 40 names of such individuals who fall under this title. Those were known, around 40 of them. The most famous though, the most famous, we have Al-Ahnaf ibn Qais. Al-Ahnaf ibn Qais. And you have Al-Aswad ibn Yazid. You have Sa'ad ibn Iyaz. Abdullah ibn Uqaym. Amr ibn Maymun. Abu Muslim, Al-Khawalani, not Al-Khawalahi. Al-Khawalani. Khawalani with N, not H. Abu Muslim Al Khawalani. From from where? From Yemen. And Abu Muslim, his story, subhanAllah, is very very amazing. He became a Muslim when the Prophet was still alive, like we said. And that was the time, during the time of Abu Bakr and people, the false prophets had to come out, the false prophets. One of the false prophets, when he saw Abu Muslim was very strong, he tried to burn him alive. Like he made a fire and put him inside. But Allah saved him. Allah saved him. And then he left and went to Medina. When he went to Medina, he met Umar. And Umar, he saw him. He said, who are you? You are Abu Muslim, aren't you? He says, yes. And Umar, he hugged him. He said, Alhamdulillah, the one who made me see in this Ummah someone who was like Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Abu Muslim al-Khawalan. Then you have Al-Najash, the king of, of Abyssinia. All of these are Al-Mukhadr. Al-Mukhadr. He says, now the main point, because we're studying knowledge of hadith. The status of a hadith narrated by a muhadram is the same as a mursal hadith narrated by a tabi, a success. There's going to be a gap. There has to be a sahaba between him and the prophet. There has to be a sahaba. Al-Ahnaf, he narrates from Umar, like we said, Abu Darda, uh, 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 Ibn Abbas, and the rest. This is because there's a cut in the Isnad, the chain of narrators between uh, uh, the Muhadram and the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is unknown. This is very clear. So that is the first generation, the Sahaba. The next generation after the Sahaba died, and when did the last Sahaba die? What year was that? 
110 Hijri. So does it mean every Tabi'i was born 111? No, like we said, no. Some of them were born when the Prophet was still alive. But they never reached the age of understanding before the Prophet ﷺ died. And the most famous example is Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. He says, The Tabi'een, whom in English they call the successors. This is any individual who met a companion of the Messenger of Allah. He met a Sahaba, believed in Islam, and died upon it. The last two conditions are the same even for the Sahaba. Who is a Sahabi? Someone who met. The Prophet of Allah believed in him and then died upon Islam. Who is a Tabi'i? Someone who met the Sahaba, the companions, believed in Islam and died upon Islam. The exact number of successors is unknown. Unknown. Even today, maybe some of you will say, oh, does it mean, you know? The Christians they can mention this a proof against us. No. Nobody knows the exact number of people living today. It's just an estimate when they tell you seven point something billion. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's just an ex estimate. Rough estimate in fact. There's so many countries in the world people don't do a census. They don't do it. And still almost every country almost I can think of every country in the world, it's not a must to do a census. You have the option to opt out. From what I know of, I could be wrong. But anyways, we don't know the exact number of, of, of successes. 150,000, 200, 300,000, nobody knows. But there was a lot of them, in fact, because now Islam had spread. Islam had spread. And like we say, for you to be a Sahabi, you, bas you basically had to go to Medina to see the Prophet, Sallallahu or Makkah when he was doing the Hajj. But for you to be a tabi'i, you can be in Sham. And you saw Mu'adh bin Jabal, Abdullah bin Bisr, you saw Abu Darda. You could be in Iraq, and you saw Anas bin Malik. You saw uh, 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 Mughira bin Shu'bah, maybe. You saw Abu Sa'id, you saw Abu Musa. You could be in Mecca, you could be in Medina. You could be in, 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 in uh, Maghrib al-Arab, you could be in Misr. And you become a tabi'i because you saw a Sahabi and you took knowledge from him. So obviously there are a lot more. A lot more. He says, there's levels of successors. There's levels of tabi'in. The levels of the tabi'in. There are three levels of the, ta of the tabi'in. I'll be using the word tabi'in, not successors. Number one, at-tabaq al-kubra, the elder level. The elder level. These were the successors of whom most of the narrations were from the companions. These ones, they were born during the early time, maybe just after the Prophet ﷺ died, during the time of Abu Bakr, before he died, during the time of Umar, meaning while they were growing up, a lot of the Sahaba were still alive. Lots of Sahaba were still alive. You get that? Most of the Sahaba are still alive, in fact. Like Al Qama bin Qais. Does that name sound familiar? Huh? Yes? Okay, tell me why it's familiar. Where did you see? Where did you find? Where did you hear it? Which hadith? Yes, which mutawatir hadith? All of you know it. Yeah, Juan, what is the best example of a mutawatir hadith? Man kadaba aliyah not that, yes? No, no, it's not, not the definition. What is the best example? No, no, yes? Innama la'amalu bin niyat. Actions are by intentions. It's not mutawatir? 
It's mutawatir ma'anawi. The meaning is mutawatir. The chain is not mutawatir. The chain is what? Gharib. The chain is gharib. Because there's only one person at four levels, in fact. The hadith was narrated from the Prophet ﷺ by who? Huh? By Umar, right? The hadith was narrated by Umar. Actions are by intentions. Who narrated from Umar? al bin Qais. It was al -Qama. Right? Only al took the hadith from Umar. Another example of, from the elder Tabi'een. The elder Tabi'een is Urwa bin Zubair ibn Awam. The son of, Ur, of, of Zubair ibn Awam. Urwa ibn Zubair. And Urwa is one of the people who narrates a, a, a lot of hadith. As you see, his father is Zubair ibn Awam. His mother was who? Asma bin Abu Bakr. Because Zubair was married to Asma. So Urwa, his father was one of the best Sahaba. His mother was one of the best Sahabiyat. He has a lot of hadith. Why? Because he took a lot of hadith from, from Aisha, who was his aunt, but, uh, maternal aunt. So he had direct access, unlike the other ones. Other people, when they had to go to Aisha, she had to wear hijab, and she'd be on the other side of the wall. But Urwa is going to her aunt's place, to his aunt's place. So he had a lot of access to Aisha's hadith. And he learned a lot from, from, from uh, 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 Abu Huraira and the rest of the Sahaba. Urwa bin Zubair, one of the elder Tabi'in. Another one, and you have to know that Urwa, like we said, is a Tabi'i. But his brother, Abdullah bin Zubair, is a Sahabi. So you can have two brothers. One is older, he's a Sahaba. One is younger, he's Tabi'i. Because this one, he saw the Prophet Sallallahu This one, he never saw the Prophet. Next one, we have Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. And all of them, like you, like, uh, you notice, there's a, a bracket showing the date of their death. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. It's also one of the kibar tabi'in. In fact, they say he is the best of the tabi'in. He is the best of the tabi'in. And he is the most knowledgeable of all the tabi'in. That's what they say. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib ibn Hazm. That's his name. His name is Sa'id, the son of al-Musayyib, the son of Hazm. What does Hazm mean? No, Hazm. Sorrow. Oh, Khuzn. Sorrow. Unhappy. That was the name of his grandfather. And the story behind that, when the Prophet, he was a Sahabi, his grandfather, he, he became Muslim. His father was a, Muslim, was a Sahabi also, Sa'id. His father, when he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, what is your name? Sa'id narrates this hadith, in fact the grandson. He said, Huzn, sorrow. The Prophet said, La, your name is Sahal, easy. This is a sunnah of the Prophet In Islam, you're not supposed to give people bad names. Number one. Number two, you're also not supposed to give people praiseworthy names. You don't praise yourself. It's not, so, it's not allowed in Islam. The Prophet would change names. Like who? Zainab, his own wife, she used to be called Barra. Barra means pious, righteous. He says, no, don't call yourself righteous. How do you know? He would change, yes, his own wife, he changed the name. Two of his wives, in fact. They used to be called Barra. He changed the name. It's not allowed, Islamical, to give yourself praiseworthy names. Or names, troublesome names, like this. Huzn. Questions at the end. Harb, you call your son Harb, war. It's always fighting. You always, the principal is always calling you from school. You have to know. You have to know. Names affect the people. This is true. Names of places, names of people, they affect that place or that people. 
this is perfectly true. We believe in that Islamic and that's what the Prophet taught us. That's why when you used to hear a bad, when you used to pass by a city and he asks a name, if it's a bad name, he says, Liar, don't stop here. Move ahead. At tafa'ul in Arabic is called at tafa'ul, being optimistic, hearing what is good. So his father, his grandfather used to be called Huzn, sadness. He said to him, No, your name will be Sahal, easy. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, how can I change a name which my father gave me? My father gave me this name, and everybody calls me by this name. I cannot change this name. So the Prophet Sami kept quiet. Now his son, Musayib, and Sa'id, he says, Wallahi, that sadness is still in us. That sadness is still in us. It is very, very important. Very, very important. So this is Sa'id. Sa'id, Sa'id was a great man. A great man, rahimahullah. He narrated, like we say, from the elder Sahab, from Uthman, Abu Huraira, Aisha, a lot. He is the best man narrating from Abu Huraira. That's something you have to know. In fact, Abu Huraira gave his daughter to him. Huh? He was married to the daughter of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, Sa'id bin Musayyib. He was a great man. Everybody knew that during his time. Everybody knew that. It was a very pious man. He says, it's been 30 years, 30 years. And whenever the Adhan is called, I'm already in the masjid. It's been 30 years. Whenever the Adhan is called, I'm already in the masjid. See, Said, And during his, the end of his life, he was tried. They put him into a trial. They put him into a trial, miskin and... The, 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 the leaders of that time they stopped him from uh, 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 teaching anyone but everyone knew his greatness in fact they say we went through the hadith mursal and if you remember when we went through the hadith mursal the hadith where the tabi'in arrest from the prophet where there is no sahab we said some marasil are more authentic than others some of them are accepted the mursal of Sa'id are accepted and I think that's only him was that who has that special? He is Mursal Hadith. When he does not mention the Sahaba, 99% it is authentic. That's how strong he was and how reliable he was. Okay? We don't want to go deep into the, 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 the biographies and the stories. That's for another time. It's for another time. Also, from the Tabaqat al Qubra, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, from the Tabaq al-Kubra of, of the Tabi'een is Ibrahim and Yazid al nakhai Ibrahim and nakhai Those four. And there's a lot again. There's a lot. But we just give those ones. Then you have the next level. Also Tabi'een. Also Tabi'een. They met the Sahaba. But they're younger. Younger. He says, these were the successors of whom most of the narrations from, from, are from other successors. And they only met a few companions. See, anyone who met just one companion is enough for you to be a tabi'i. If you only met Anas bin Malik, who was from the last ones to die, you are tabi'i. And you took knowledge from him, you are tabi'i. Okay, you don't have to meet all of them. You don't have to meet Abu Bakr or Umar, no. You met one Sahaba, you had reached the level of understanding, and you heard something from him, from the Prophet, you are a Talia. The first group we just mentioned, they met most of the Sahaba. They lived with the Sahaba. The second level, they did not meet most of the Sahaba, they met few. They met few. Examples, he says, Abiz Zinad. Abiz Zinad. He's famous. Our brothers from Morocco should know Abu Zinad. Right or wrong? And our brothers from Algeria. They should know Abu Zinad. Because every Friday after the Adhan is called, they narrate the hadith from Imam Malik and his Muatta. From who? From Al-A'raj, from Abu Zinad, from Abu Huraira, 
that the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever does laghu in the masjid, when the Imam is doing the khutbah, then there's no jum'ah for him. It's a bid'ah to do that after the adhan, but they do that in North Africa, Morocco especially, to the point that even the grandmothers in the house, they've memorized that hadith with the chain. Because every Friday you hear it all your life. Abu Zinad is one of the tabi'in. He took hadith from Abu Huraira and other sahabas, from Aisha, from other sahabas, Abu Zinad. Another one, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan. Yahya ibn Sa'id, Imam al-Kabir, Imam, a great Imam. Does he sound familiar? I don't expect you to know him, but these other brothers were here for the first series of class. Does it sound familiar? Yes? Who said yes? Yes, where? The hadith gharib, which hadith, Shaykh? Inna ma la'amalu binniyat. The hadith comes from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then who? Umar. From Umar? Al-Qama. From Al-Qama? Muhammad bin Muthanna. From Muhammad? Yahya ibn Sa'id. And all of those four we said are all tabi'in. All of them. Muhammad bin Muthanna, Yahya ibn Sa'id, and Al-Qama. We said there's four tabi'in in that chain. Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan. He narrated a lot of hadith, a lot of hadith. Next, you have the other group, the third group, the third level of the tabi'in. This is sughra. It's a mistake from those who translated this, this book. Number two should read at-tabaqul wustwa. Number three should be at-tabaqul sughra. Okay? If you look at your book, Number two, if you don't know, just look at the screen. Right there. You see that word which is highlighted? as sughra That should be here. That one should be here. It should be at number three. And wusta goes to two. 